Hi everyone, welcome back to Five Quote Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. Today we're going to look at Act 2, Scene 4. In this series, what I do is I first give you a very brief nutshell summary of the events of the plot of each scene, and then I dig deeply into each scene and I pull out the quotes that I think will be useful to help you understand the plays, themes, and characters. The scene opens in the streets of Verona with Mercutio and Benvolio awaiting the lover Romeo. Mercutio, the mocker, mocks Romeo for his love sickness, and he mocks Tybalt for being a fashionable dandy. Romeo arrives and the boys exchange banter. Mercutio, the Peter Pan, is happy to have Romeo as one of the boys again, forgetting about love. The nurse then arrives and Mercutio takes the opportunity to tease her mercilessly, and then he and Benvolio leave and Romeo is alone with the nurse. Romeo tells the nurse to tell Juliet to meet him at Friar Lawrence's cell that afternoon to be married. Okay, the first part of this scene is dominated by Mercutio's grumbling. He's grumbling that his buddy's not around. He's grumbling that his buddy's been taken away by a girlfriend. Now, remember, there's a bit of bromance happening here. And when, when you do have a bromance and a girlfriend enters the picture, there's always going to be rivalry and jealousy because you lost your bro. You lost your bro to the girlfriend. So, so there's, there's bitterness there. And again... Mercutio shows the outsider because he doesn't have a girlfriend as we as we've talked about already he grumbles about the Capulets there's tension brewing there he grumbles again about Romeo being dead about 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 Rosalind's the wench's black eye of Rosalind so there there's a there's bitterness for you he, he, he grumbles a lot about Tybalt. He sees Tybalt as his chief rival, as the chief problem, and rightly so, because remember, Mercutio and Tybalt are counterparts. They are both the hot-headed. They are both representatives of the hothead on either side of the in-group, out-group divide, both pointless in their, in their, in their rancor. He complains that Mercutio is the, is, uh, sorry, that Mercutio complains that Tybalt is the prince of cats, um, meaning he, he think he sees Tybalt's dueling style as as faddish and fashionable and different from Mercutio's. Do you see? Maybe Mercutio was schooled in the in the English school of fencing, maybe more traditional, and Tybalt's style is different. He, it, it it seems to come from the continent, from from France, which Mercutio doesn't like. I think he's depicted here as a bit of a bigot. Okay, this 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 lisping, affecting, he, he, he's criticizing Tybalt's style, he's a fashion monger, and what, what clinches that for me is when he, he greets Romeo, Romeo enters and he says, Romeo, bonjour, there's a French salutation to your French slop. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? There, there, there's, there's a, f a, 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 a hatred and, and a bigotry towards something that is alien to Mercutio. Tybalt has a different style. Now, if we could hear the voice of Tybalt complaining about Mercutio's style, we'd probably hear this, the, the, the mirror image of this kind of intolerance and bigotry. The sad outsider, the bigot, all of this is very, very sour. He's got nothing good to say about anybody. It's Mercutio. What follows then is actually pretty funny. It's, it's the boys being boys, that they're exchanging banter, and it's really quite hilarious. I don't have time to get into all of it now, but Romeo's engaging again. He's back with the boys, and after all of that, it's, it's quite long and, and entertaining. Mercutio is, he, he, with a sigh of relief, he says, why is, this, is not this better now than groaning for love? Don't you appreciate being back with the boys? Now art thou sociable. You're one of the boys again. Now art thou Romeo. Now art thou what thou art by by art as well as by nature. Now, I find that terribly ironic. Um, the whole play, I think, is about finding the true self. One of the things that the play is about is about finding the true self, and, and one of the expressions of the true self is, is, is your love. Where do you put your love? Are you free to put your love wherever you have to put your love because of, because of who you are? And, and Mercutio is desperate for Romeo to only be that bro, to only be one of the boys and to not have that other dimension because Mercutio doesn't have that other dimension to his life. It's, it's quite sad. He, he's, it, it's a truncated life that this man is living. He's, he's living a half life. He doesn't understand that other side. For this driveling love is like a great natural that l runs lolling up and down to hide his bauble in a hole. Now, what he means by this is the court gesture, so a fool, and the fool had a little stick with a little doll head on it, right? And so he, 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 he's comparing love to a fool, which is his statement. He believes that 
love is a waste of time. It's your it, it, a cynical view of love. It's only sex, and it's 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 a foolish thing to uh, to pursue. This has a strong sexual suggestion to it. Uh, running around with a stick to put to hide in a hole. So so that there, that's that's quite obvious there. Crude, crude, cynical, and ultimately sad. When the nurse arrives, Mercutio turns his attention to her and mocks her mercilessly. Remember, it's really easy to mock because you, when you because you are an outsider, the outsiders mock because they don't have to participate. It's difficult to participate in in in, in life. Romeo is the is 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 the, is the lover. He's going to go on to raise a family and all that stuff. That's hard work. It's hard work. And Mercutio can sit back and say, "I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to play video games all day, so I can sit back and mock all you guys who are actually doing the hard work of real life." The nurse too is engaged in real life. She's she's had a tough life on her own, raising other people's kids. Her own kid died. She's had a tough life, so it's really easy to stand back and mock someone like her, who's quite big, I suppose, in gait. She's got flouncy clothes, and so he mocks her as looking as resembling a, a sailing ship. He mocks her as being a bod, uh, which is basically a whore. Nice guy, right? Really, really nice guy. Sings a song about her. Again, it's all quite funny, and we, we, we chuckle at it. But at the same time, we understand that this is cruel. It's, 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 it's pointlessly cruel uh, and, and, and reveals more about the cruel mocker than it does about anything else. Mercutio and Benvolio leave, and the nurse is incensed. She, she calls Mercutio a scurvy knave for teasing her, so I'm none of his flirt jills. I'm none of his skeins mates. And then we get into the, 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 the real crux of this scene, which is exactly what I just mentioned, the contrast between an unworthy hero, an unworthy male, and the worthy male. And that theme, that, that there, there are hints about this, what constitutes the worthy hero, the worthy male, versus the unworthy for the rest of the scene. Peter is with the nurse, and as soon as Mercutio goes, she turns her attention to Peter and accuses him of not being a worthy male. And thou must stand by too and suffer every knave to use me at his pleasure. There, there's a lot revealed here uh, about the contrast between what constitutes the real, the, the, uh, the worthy hero and the, the unworthy hero. Peter doesn't live up to the standards. He, he, he's not, he doesn't he doesn't defend what he should have defended. Mercutio, of course, doesn't live up to the standards because he's, the, he's, he's, he's cruel. The theme of revenge, theme nine, the theme of revenge is, is, is reintroduced here. Ironically, there's a paradox going on. If revenge is bad, which is what Shakespeare seems to be suggesting throughout the grander plot of the play, then why do we kind of agree with the nurse here that Peter should have stood up to Mercutio. It's really interesting. Revenge is bad, but at the very same time, it's actually expected of the worthy hero. He kind of grumbles and says, you know, if, if, if I see occasion at a, for in, in a good quarrel and the law is on my side, then I will defend. Well, what constitutes a good quarrel? That's a good question, too. This next quote is one of my favorites in the whole play. It's, it's, it's by the nurse, and she says to Romeo, okay, look, I've got something to relay to you, but I, I have to speak for myself first. First, let me tell ye, if ye should lead her into a fool's paradise, as they say, it were a very gross kind of behavior, as they say, for the gentlewoman is young, and therefore, if you should deal double with her, truly, it were an ill thing to be offered to any gentlewoman and very weak dealing. What a lovely statement of what it means to be a good man. It, it's simple, it's sincere, it's unaffected, it's perfectly natural, it's coming from her heart of hearts. And she, she, if you can hear the language here, she's stuttering and stammering, as they say, she's trying to, 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 to make the language sound more sophisticated than she has the power to, to, to make it. Um, but it is, it's a statement. And, and remember what I mentioned before about contrasts. We, 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 the, play, the scene opened with Mercutio as grossly unworthy. Peter, somewhat unworthy. This kind of guy that she's describing here, again, grossly unworthy. And then we get the picture of who Romeo really is. That's how contrasts work in, in literature and in, in all kinds of art, really. 
Romeo tries to protest that he would never deal doubly with Juliet, but the nurse doesn't give him time to finish. Good heart and in faith, I will tell her as much. Lord, Lord, she will be a joyful woman. I like this quote because it reveals the, 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 the contrast, be, again, between the nurse and the mother, Lady Capulet. Lady Capulet is a political thinker. The nurse is not. She's the exact opposite of being a political thinker. She thinks, she doesn't think, she feels and then speaks, and feels and then speaks. Absolutely spontaneous, simple, and sincere. Now, like everything else in the play, there is both vice and virtue in that kind of thinking. Why is she so quick to trust Romeo? She doesn't know him very well. Later on, the nurse makes a tragic fault as well, as, as we will see. So she's not perfect in this. She, her, her, her sincerity doesn't make her a perfect character. Again, that's the whole point of the play, is, is the complexity of human nature. In terms of plot, Romeo reveals that they will meet at Fire Lawrence's cell where they can be married. He says that my servant, my man, will, will, will go to the Capulets with a rope ladder to rescue the damsel trapped in the tower of the Capulet, of society, of, of Capulets, the, the dragon society, the dragon father and mother. He will rescue them. Now, we return again to the theme of the worthy hero when the nurse says, is your man secret? Is your servant trustworthy? The secret here means trust, trustworthy. And Romeo says, yeah, my man's as true as steel. Now, again, I'm, I'm maybe belaboring the point, but I don't think so. This whole scene is organized around uh, the question of, of manhood and good manhood, worthy hero manhood. And, and, and that's another example of it. We return again when the nurse starts prattling on. She's got all this, all these ideas and excitement bubbling around in her head. And she, again, she's unpolitical, so she doesn't plan what she says. It just comes out of her head. And in her rattling around in her head are notions of Paris. And she says, oh, everybody says that Paris is the proper man, but I don't think so. I think you're better than him. Again, we're back again to an unworthy hero. Another example of what, what, what it means not to be uh, the proper man. And the scene just kind of kind of fizzles out, actually. The nurse kind of loses track in her excitement. She loses track of what she wants to say, and then they just kind of wrap it up and, and they leave. And that's the end of Romeo and Juliet, Act 2, Scene 4. Come back for my next video, Act 2, Scene 5, where the nurse returns to Juliet with all of the good news. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.